to Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Centre for Policy Studies. I'm Robert Colville. I'm the Think Tank's director. Um, I'll get out of the way very quickly because we have two brilliant speakers uh, today. Um, Stanley Johnson is the international ambassador for the Conservative Environment Network, and he will introduce our main speaker, Dr. Liam Fox. Uh, Liam is the former Trade Secretary and is speaking today on the hugely important and topical uh, subject of a carbon border tax and how Britain can reconcile its uh, ambition for free trade with its ambition to help save the planet. Uh, this couldn't be a more topical uh, speech or a more interesting one. Um, with that, I'll hand over straight to Stanley. And I should say quickly before I do that, um, there will be questions afterwards which I'll be putting to Liam Fox from off camera. Uh, if you've got anything to ask, please uh, uh, tweet at CPS Think Tank on Twitter or make comments in the YouTube box and it will be picked up by our team here. Thank you very much. Well, Robert, thank you very much, very much indeed for that. It is indeed a great honor to, to be able to introduce introduce um, Dr. Liam Fox, whose biography is um, uh, pretty extraordinary because he's been North MP, of, uh, MP for North Somerset since 1992. He's been Secretary of State for Defence. He's been Secretary of, Trade for, Secretary of State for International Trade, President of the Board of Trade, and he was the UK nominee to be the Director General of the World Trade Organization. I would point out, uh, of course, that he is um, a real doctor as well. I don't know. I don't mean that disparagingly to those who have PhDs. He probably got lots of PhDs as well. But if you collapse in the street, um, you know, you can rely on, on Dr. Fox to look after you, <coughs> whatever your name is, even if you're, even if you're called uh, Dominic Cummings. Um, that's the last <laughs> I'm going to say, the only thing I'm going to say today about Dominic. Anyway, it is, it is tremendous news, Liam, that, that you're here. Tremendous news that you're dealing with this topic. And I've got to say, um, I can't help feeling that the Conservatives, even Conservative MPs, even Conservative members of the body I represent, the Conservative Environment Network, have been a little bit hesitant in coming forward to speak up about carbon taxes, and particularly about carbon border taxes. That's why having you here today making this speech is actually quite a significant moment. You could say, it's, is, it, is it the fox among the the hens, the hen coop, who can say? But the, the, I think you'll stir the... And I notice, I notice, um, Liam, that you've already made the headline. If, if I do this, will, will the camera pick that up? Will it? Um, Tories push MP on carbon border tax. And I, I won't tell you what you said, because you're going to say what you're going to say. <laughs> and the FT, may have, the FT may have got it wrong. But I do notice that this, this self-same article, and by the way, the FT, knowing you were doing it, has just produced a 20-page summon, 20-page special supplement about your speech called <laughs> Europe's Climate Leader. So they are on the ball. However, Robert, I know you, you, we have links with the Sunday Times, so I don't want to go on about the, again, on about the FT, but I notice this particular article does also say um, Dr. Fox will be introduced today by Stanley Johnson, the Prime Minister's father, okay, who said that the logic of a border tax was irrevitable. So I better say that, since I meant to have said it. Okay, I say the logic of a border tax is irrefutable. And actually, why do I say that? Because I'm one of the few people who probably have studied, and obviously Dr. Fox has too, in detail, the, the withdrawal, the trade and withdrawal agreement, which was adopted right at the end of last year. And if you actually look at paragraph, at article seven, three, which is entitled carbon pricing, you will see article para one says each party shall have in place an effective system of carbon pricing as of January the 1st, 2021, which is you know, like three months ago. And then it says each system shall cover greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation, heat generation, industry, and aviation. Okay, there, there, by the way, there's a two year exemption um, for av aviation, you've got the two years to, to bring it in. But the point I'm trying to get at is we already have legally binding rules on carbon pricing because this is a treaty between the EU and the UK. It's not, this bio, this article says it's not optional. It's not like the Northern Ireland Protocol where you, you, know, you maybe you can dispense with it under certain circumstances. Now, so if I say it is irrefutable and irreluctable. That's what it is. And Dr. Fox is now going to explain in detail um, to you why you actually have to have if, you have, if you have internal carbon systems, inevitably, 
you have to have a border tax. And this is, this is, the, this is, the, uh, this is the key point. And we're jolly lucky, I would say in conclusion, we are jolly lucky that he is here um, to deal with this for us. Because, you know, I've heard very senior ministers of the, of the government, insofar as they've focused on this issue at all, talk in sort of very woolly terms of carbon leakage, as though you could just go to a, a chemist on the corner and get some absorbent, <laughs> <laughs> absorbent package to deal with carbon leakage. Well, it's far more serious than that. And we have a real doctor, as I said. We have the fantastic Dr. Fox with us today to give us a true prescription, and I believe we are all going to welcome it. Dr. Fox, it's all yours. Thank you, Sandy, very much. And thank you to the CPS for hosting us today. When I um, left the Cabinet in 2019, with the Prime Minister having given me a little additional reading time, I decided to put it to good use and I delved into the literature to determine for myself, someone with a scientific background, whether there was overwhelming evidence for human-driven global warming or whether it was, as some claim, a great global conspiracy. And there were and there are two basic questions to answer, whether global warming is real, and if it is, what is the cause? The evidence of climactic change is all around us. Today, the sea level is four to eight inches higher than it was a century ago. Why has this happened? Firstly, over the past 100 years, mountain glaciers, Arctic glaciers and Greenland's ice have decreased dramatically in size with melting water flowing in to our oceans. Equally important, ocean water expands as it warms, increasing its volume, and so the water in the ocean takes up more space and the sea level is higher. And this is a direct effect of rising temperatures. And the trend is actually amplified by the effects of water itself. With every extra degree of air temperature, the atmosphere can absorb 7% more water vapour. And that matters because water vapour is a strong and fast feedback mechani mechanism that amplifies change in surface temperatures in response to other factors such as CO2 by about a factor of two. And globally, water vapour concentration in the lower atmosphere has increased by 3 to 4% since the 1970s. In his excellent book, which I recommend anyone who's interested in the subject to read, Paleoclimate by Michael Bender, he points out that in our history, uh, the history of our planet, there have been huge swings in our climate. We've had multiple periods when the Earth was glaciated to the equator, sometimes lasting millions of years, and others when it was so warm that dinosaurs roamed the Antarctic. And he set out the four factors that have caused these great climate modifications. Changes in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, changes in the amount of the sun's radiation reflected directly to space, changes in the position of the continents that guide winds and ocean currents, and changes in the brightness of the sun. And I think it is very difficult, if you read the literature, with an open mind to come to any other conclusion than that global warming and climate change with unpredictable consequences are real, and that changes in greenhouse gas concentrations are by far the most likely reason. So let's look at the current picture of global greenhouse emissions, and there are two ways that I find helpful to do this. The first is to look at which countries are producing the most emissions. Today, 17 countries in the world produce more than 1% each of the world's total CO2. Of the top six, China produces 27.9%, followed by the United States on 14.5%, India on 7.2%, Russia 4.6%, Japan 3 and Iran 2.14%. 11 other countries produce between 1 and 2%, ranging from Germany's 1.93% all the way down to, in 17th place, the UK on 1.01%. Now, another way to look at this is to examine which countries are still increasing their production of CO2 and which ones are decreasing. And between 2009 and 2019, we've seen some very big reductions in a number of countries. The US has reduced its emissions by 3.75%, Japan by 4.82%, Germany by 11.14%, France by 15.2%, and stunningly the United Kingdom comes top with a reduction of 25.1%. By contrast, there are some countries going in the other direction. 
Canada has increased by 6.3%, Russia by 9.7%, South Korea by 20.5%, Turkey 28.6%, China 31 Brazil 33 Indonesia 38 and India 62%. And I make these points because any attempt to deal with the situation must accept the basic premise that this is a global problem and global problems require global solutions. And here at the CPS, we would do well to remember the words of Margaret Thatcher at the second World Climate Conference way back in November 1990, when she said, the danger of global warming is as yet unseen, but real enough for us to make changes and sacrifices so that we do not live at the expense of future generations. Our ability to come together to stop or limit damage to the world's environment will be perhaps the greatest test of how far we can act as a world community. Here we are in 2021 and how prophetic those words turned out to be. If we're to, be, to deal effectively with the challenge, we need to establish policies and mechanisms that will encourage a shift away from CO2 production in those countries who are contributing most to the problem. With a huge reduction, as I've said, in UK admissions, emission, emissions in recent years, there's little point in introducing domestic measures that will overstress our economy and our society while others continue to increase their emissions. There's no point in damaging the competitiveness of economies such as the UK while other countries maintain their competitive edge at a cost to the global climate. So what in practical terms can be done? Well, I believe, unsurprising, that, that using market mechanisms offer the best hope and a carbon, a carbon border adjustment mechanism of some sort is already being considered in several parts of the world. John Kerry recently said that President Biden, I know, is particularly interested in evaluating the border adjustment mechanism. He wants to look at that and see whether that's something we need to deploy. Western countries do not want to see their own companies moving their manufacturing bases to places like China or India because of their less stringent environmental rules and consequent lower costs. And President Biden's administration certainly listed carbon border adjustments as part of its 2021 trade agenda. Let's just for a moment consider the politics there. For the Biden administration, such a mechanism would allow the United States to be simultaneously tough on countries like China while emphasising their environmental credentials. It will be highly tempting with a split Congress and midterm elections already looming. And of course, the US president could use the pre precedent of his predecessor and unilaterally impose the tax if carbon intensive products were deemed to be a national security risk and President Trump did it on steel and aluminium, including to the United Kingdom. Though I doubt if there will again be much appetite to repeat this very dubious tactic. The EU is also, as we know, committed to a carbon border adjustment mechanism as part of its Green Deal agenda. So what are the policy options that we have? Well, I believe that the most obvious tool is a carbon border tax, or perhaps best seen as a carbon border tariff. This is simply a charge on carbon emissions attributed to imported goods that have not been carbon taxed at source. The aim is to put an additional price on imports from countries where it's cheaper to pollute and level the playing field for domestic industries that produce goods with lower levels of greenhouse emissions. In many ways, it is a win-win. Countries such as the UK or those in the European Union argue that producers in their own countries who have already applied measures to reduce emissions through carbon pricing are handing foreign suppliers who do not bear these costs a competitive advantage. And over time, they argue, it will shift production to low-cost, high-emission countries, which will have the net effect of punishing our own industries and jobs, damaging our international competitive uh, nature, yet doing little to limit global emissions themselves. Now, it's useful just at this point, I think, to distinguish between a national carbon tax and a carbon border tax. A national carbon tax is a fee that government imposes to encourage reduced 
greenhouse emissions. We all know the consequences that that can have and increased costs for household consumers and businesses alike. But the point of the policy is clear. By contrast, a carbon border tax or tariff is able to protect a country's national manufacturers while at the same time motivating them to adhere to green regulations. Now, many EU companies complain at having been at a cost disadvantage as they've been paying for carbon emissions since 2005 under the EU's emissions trading system. Obviously, this includes UK companies while we were in the European Union. A carbon border tax can therefore lead to a rebalancing against importers from those nations with more lax environmental standards. It can also be argued that a carbon border tax can improve domestic support for climate change policies by securing the buy-in of local industry for deeper decarbonise policies, if they believe the process is fair and balanced. In recent months, there's been growing pressure on the European Union to hasten the introduction of a carbon border tax as record prices for CO2 allowances have raised the cost of polluting in the bloc far above any other global region. Carbon prices in the EU's flagship emissions trading scheme, a key part of the plan to cut emissions by 55% by 2030, are above 50 euros a tonne, more than double their pre-pandemic level. And many across industry argue that pricing of this level is counterproductive as it can starve companies of the funds they need to invest in decarbonisation itself. Steel producers estimate that the EU carbon price is now costing them approximately €95 Euros per tonne of steel produced, since the production of one tonne on average emits two tonnes of CO2. That's almost 10% of the current steel price of close to €1,000 per tonne. And this clearly inhibits national and global competitiveness of the companies that fall within the regime. So, using this as an example, what effect would a carbon border tax have on the steel sector? Well, the answer is that it would have a different impact on steel imports depending on the country of origin. For example, Chinese steel manufacturers primarily use blast furnaces and basic oxygen furnaces emitting about two metric tonnes of CO2 equivalent per metric tonne of steel produced. Turkish companies, by contrast, mainly use electric arc furnaces, emitting only one metric tonne of CO2 equivalent per metric tonne of steel produced. So a carbon border tax would differentially affect Chinese and Turkish steel exports and be much more favourable to the lower carbon emission producers. So the principles of a carbon border tax are, I believe, relatively straightforward. But as ever in politics, there are complex practical issues to be resolved. Which countries and which industries should be covered and on what basis? How do we measure emissions and how do we ensure that there is sufficient verification to avoid cheating? How do we determine equivalence between systems that have different carbon pricing mechanisms and levels? How do we set an appropriate level for a carbon border tax? How do we ensure that any measures are in line with existing World Trade Organization obligations? And how do we ensure that we do not disproportionately affect developing countries and undermine our own development agenda? Some developing countries have argued already that such a policy runs counter to the Paris Agreement's bottom-up, nationally determined contributions. Emerging economies like Brazil, South Africa, India and China have already criticised the unpublished EU plan as discriminatory and unfair to developing nations. Working out which countries are subject to the tax requires some way of balancing different carbon regimes, something that Jonathan Pershing, a member of the U US Climate Envoys team, has warned will be extremely complicated, and I think most of us accept that. The early discussions between the United States and the European Union have been a good example of some of the practical challenges we will face. The United States doesn't have a harmonised carbon price because it chose not to implement an emissions trading scheme at a federal level. And it's pretty inconceivable, I have to say, that President Biden would get bipartisan congressional support for introducing one now, especially in the current political climate. 
Jonathan Pershing has pointed out that the United States does have substantial and rigorous investment and regulatory programs, but these are somewhat more difficult to compare and contrast. But whether there is a direct price like an emissions tracing scheme or a direct carbon tax or a regulatory measure, mechanisms will need to be found to weigh them one against the other if equivalent regimes are to be established. When it comes to compliance with international rules, any scheme that a country or trading bloc chooses to implement will need to apply to every other country that imports goods into that country or bloc in order to be compatible with WTO obligations. But there may well be room within the current rules to exempt some of the world's poorest nations. On the issue of price setting, uh, Nikos Safos, a senior fellow with the Energy and National Security Programme at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, where I've spoken a number of times, talks about finding a sweet spot. Set the carbon price too high, he said, and you splinter the world trading system. One world becomes low carbon, another becomes high carbon with limited trade between them. Set the price too low and it becomes a modest cost that is absorbed into the final prices without much decarbonisation impact. The price, therefore, must be just right. It should allow the most technologically advanced firms in emerging economies to be competitive and incentivise the rest to invest in lower carbon approaches. Otherwise, whatever gains are made inside the low carbon block will be offset by what happens outside of it. How any exporting country would be affected by a carbon border tax will be dependent on the economic sectors within the scope of the tax, as I've mentioned, the level of fossil fuels used in the industries of the exporting country, the proportion of its exports going to the CBT jurisdiction, and the proportion of high emission products in its overall export mix. Quite a complex picture. And this will be of particular importance to developing countries. Of course, let's remember that many of these will not export either large volumes or proportions of energy-intensive products. To give a practical example, over 90% of the exports from the East African community countries are primary products, 81% of which are agricultural products and 8% fishery products. These are currently exempted from the European emissions trading system and they might reasonably expect exemption, at least in the short term, from any carbon border tax imposed by countries such as the EU or trading blocs such as the European Union. There is one sector, however, which is likely to prove problematic, and that is the textile industry, which has a substantial greenhouse gas footprint, contributing around 10% of global emissions. While clearly there would be a strong incentive to see these reduced, many of the textile exporters are amongst the world's poorest countries. I accept that it's unavoidable that a carbon border tax will result in the reshaping of global trade policy. But this also needs to be seen in the context of other changes already taking place. Energy transition itself will benefit those countries with good solar and wind resources, while it will disadvantage those producing coal and oil. And just as with these wider changes, the development of carbon border taxes will need to be accompanied by policies that help poorer nations transition to a new global trading environment. The obligations of those of us in the developed countries then is to accompany the changes with fair transition policies. But just consider this. I believe that it's possible that a carbon border adjustment could positively shape the development path of some of these countries going forward. With the cost of clean energy dropping dramatically, the right support from developed countries could help these countries leapfrog those with legacy assets. For the UK, reorientating our development funding towards those countries whose development is based on clean energy clearly makes sense to us from a climate perspective as well as offering, it has to be said, export opportunities to UK businesses in the sector. The alternative to all of this is to fund those who may be using, for example, Chinese-built coal-fired power stations, undermining our own climate objectives 
with our own taxpayers' money. I do not, incidentally, believe that Whitehall would not be capable of producing such an outcome, which is why there needs to be a substantial re-engineering of the mechanics of government in the UK if global Britain is to be more than just a worthy aspiration. Let me make just a separate mention about China, the world's second biggest economy and the driver of much of recent global economic growth. China's continuing reliance on non-renewable energy to power its economy leaves it particularly vulnerable in this conversation. For example, given that China produces steel with blast furnaces that released a large amount of carbon, as I have already mentioned, it will have to pay an additional layer of carbon border tax, which will increase its costs and its market price. That will obviously reduce the competitiveness of steel produced in China compared to steel from other countries that uh, make their steel in more carbon efficient mills and don't therefore have to pay the additional tax. Now while this will be very welcome to steel producers here, it's already provoked a strong reaction in Beijing, with the government there declaring that, quote, we need to prevent unilateralism and protectionism from hurting global growth expectations and the will of countries to combat, combat climate change together. Beijing also claims that the new tax would violate the core principle of the Paris Accord, which is that richer countries should bear greater responsibility for cutting emissions. China, as one of the most influential countries in the world right now, and as the largest greenhouse gas producer, plays a crucial role in tackling climate change. On one hand, we can't afford to lose China in the fight against climate change. But the UK, the EU and the US play a more substantial role in China's economy than the other way around, as we purchase more goods from China than China does from us. And this, to me, suggests that China would pay a more substantial price uh, by losing big Western economies as key export markets. Consequently, I believe that China is likely to comply with a carbon border tax, however unwillingly, especially if there is close cooperation and coordination amongst those Western nations applying it. There might also be other geopolitical consequences of following such approach which I think have been under-discussed. One, for example, could be the impact on the crude oil market. It could become cheaper, for example, for chemical producers, particularly in Europe, to import more oil from Saudi Arabia and less from Russia, as the Saudi extraction methods have a much lower carbon footprint than the Russians. This may actually have a political attraction to a number of countries, though it does leave Germany in a difficult position where that country's selfish commitment to Nord Stream 2 is undiminished despite opposition from its EU and NATO partners. Here at the CPS, as you might imagine, I've considered the fact that as a passionate free trader, I have to wrestle with the wider consequences of following a carbon border tax policy. But as I often repeat it, as International Trade Secretary, free trade does not and has never meant a free for all. Ricardo's competitive advantage still has plenty of room for expression given the range of divergences in the global economy, including labour rates and the built-in welfare costs of the developed countries. But if we believe that the need to deal with climate change is an imperative, and I believe it is, then we must find and apply global solutions to this most global problem. And we have a great opportunity to do so with our current chairmanship of the G7. And as we head towards COP26 in Glasgow, we must use the opportunity not just to chair, but to lead. If chairing and leading were the same thing, we wouldn't require two different words in the dictionary. <coughs> as Mrs Thatcher put it, no one should underestimate the imagination that will be required, nor the scientific effort, nor the unprecedented cooperation we will have to show. We shall need statesmanship of a rare order. That was and is a historic challenge to which it is our duty to rise.
Liam, thank you very much. Am I just, I'm, I'm on camera, and we have a, a bumper crop of questions uh, <laughs> for you. Um, I, I suppose the, the, the first one would be, uh, would be from me. You, you, you were explicit in that, that, um, that this might involve uh, increasing costs for, for consumers and indeed for British, for British industry, I mean, which would be one of the central cri criticisms of this idea. How do you, how do you, how do you address that, that, that effectively you're, you're, make, you're harming the economy by making imports more expensive? Well, it's counterbalanced, I think, by the benefits to the domestic economy of the uh, incentives to produce things in the UK. And one of the problems we've had with climate is the offshoring of our manufacturing capabilities. Uh, I don't think it makes any sense when we are actually asking already businesses and consumers to bear the cost uh, of carbon pricing that we have our businesses produce goods in, in countries that are high emitters. Um, uh, effectively, we're, again, we're undermining our own policies uh, through that mechanism. So I think in the longer term, of course, once these countries themselves take uh, the measures required to reduce their carbon emissions, the carbon tax will fall uh, and prices would uh, uh, accordingly. But I think it, it's, it goes back to uh, uh, the basic point I made earlier, which to paraphrase is there's no point in pauperizing the United Kingdom during the process of decarbonisation if we have Chinese businessmen arriving around in Rolls Royces. Um, we've got to make sure that that process is, is fair and balanced. Uh, and while we accept um, some of these, I think it's much easier for the British public to accept the cost involved in climate change if we know that that cost is being fairly spread by mechanisms such as this. Uh, a similar question, well, well two, two questions which I'll, I'll combine. What do you think should be done with the revenue uh, from this tax? Uh, one of our viewers suggests um, hypothecating, hi, hypothecating it to fund uh, sequestration and energy efficiency or uh, retrofitting business building stock. I mean, isn't, the, isn't the, the likelihood that it's just simply swallowed by the Treasury and added to the, to the pile? Well, I would love it to be swallowed by the Treasury in terms of debt reduction. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned, unreconstructed Thatcherite when it comes to money. I believe in sound money. I believe that we shouldn't be spending money um, uh, that the next generation will have to pay back. And I would like to see the generation of any more income actually used to reduce the level of debt um, so that we're not exposing future generations to greater economic risk than, than we absolutely have to. So I'm afraid I'm a very boring, uh, old-fashioned fiscal conservative on that front. Um, the question from Hannah Dillon, head of the Zero Carbon campaign. Um, do you think uh, the UK has a responsibility to drive multilateral engagement with this concept, uh, not least in considering and alleviating concerns raised by developing countries? And actually, a, a sort of allied question from Tony Lodge, who's a research fellow here at the CPS. Um, Kwasi Kwarteng, before he became business secretary, said that policies like these needed to be adopted in tandem with, with other countries. Um, if this can't be achieved, um, should, the lead, uh, should the UK lead by example and uh, adopt this, uh, such, such measures unilaterally? Yes. Um, and here we are, you know, the CPS is looking around me, but all these uh, things that are um, uh, in memory of uh, things that Mrs Thatcher said. One of the things that she used to regularly say was, I'm not a great fan of followership, but I am a fan of leadership. And I think that um, we should remember that. We, we have a role to play, but I was standing for that Director General job at the, uh, in Geneva for the WTO. These were the arguments that came up all the time and people wanted the United Kingdom to take a lead in this. People know how influential we are globally. And uh, I think that taking a lead should come naturally to us. Now, there are a lot of moving pieces, as I've said, um, in all of this, but I do think we should take a lead. Um, I would rather as not doing it unilaterally. I'd like to do it in concert with the United States. I'd like to do it in concert with the European Union. I think that provides a very large economic base from which to, to launch a policy like this. But we do need to think about some of the development concepts um, in this. Uh, there are adequate uh, exemptions for the smallest countries. The problems, I think, will come with the larger developing countries um, who are currently uh, creating the model for growth and energy generation through fossil fuels. And I think that for a country like the United Kingdom, one of the biggest donors globally, one of the things that we could do is to re-engineer our development policy to ensure that countries that want to have clean energy are helped to do so by our own development uh, funding. Uh, otherwise, as I say, you can get the perverse outcome that we are funding those countries for development 
they're using more fossil fuels to produce energy and undermining our own climate change objectives with our own money. Um, and it's, it's, where I, it's where I mean that all the bits of government need to join up. You cannot have a development policy, a trade and investment policy, uh, an environment policy that are running on parallel tracks. They have to converge uh, and we have to find ways of bringing the different bits of government to bear to ensure that we are all working for the same objectives and different bits of government are not working for different objectives. Um, Stanley said um, and, uh, that uh, you, the, I am perfectly convinced the PM is seized by the absolute logic of the carbon border tax. Does that, uh, th does that re reflect your own conversations with him and, and with other senior ministers? I, I, think that, I think that there is a growing awareness that uh, a carbon border tax um, is, is one of the ways forward that we will have to adopt if we want to ensure that we don't get the sort of um, perverse outcomes that I, I suggested earlier. Um, and if you're going to have, if you're going to deal with a global problem, you've got to have global solutions. They can't be purely domestic. Uh, otherwise, you put a greater and greater cost onto British business and British consumers uh, without actually getting the benefit of the overall global carbon emission reduction. We've got, we've got to link um, those, these two elements because I think in many ways they're delinked at the moment. And the danger there is you'll get a diminishing acceptance politically from the British public uh, about, about the climate change agenda. So I think it's much easier to sell to the British people if you can include the one word that matters most to them than any other, which is fair. Is it fair? Is it d demonstrably so? And can we show that uh, there will be a direct benefit uh, for any cost that's applied. Um, sorry, Stanley, you wanted to ask a, a question in your own right. Yes, I do, if I may. Um, the British government has got two international priorities at the top of this now. Climate change is one, and biodiversity is another. And as far as I thought, your speech was superb. Listen to every word of it. One thing that strikes me is the need also to take into account the, the biodiversity aspect. Now, at the moment, the ETS schemes we have you know, don't, on the whole, deal with agriculture. You, you, you accepted that. And yet some of the biggest impacts of global biodiversity, which we are certainly interested in conserving, are the agricultural mm. products and the forestry products. So here's my thought. In the long run, as we go ahead on this one, we ought also to be envisaging, if you like, a biodiversity border border tax. I know I don't want to overload this because we've only got three, three sectors now, but I think we absolutely have to bear in mind not just the carbon impact of our imports, but the biodiversity impact. And one last point. One of the good things about what you were saying was that actually you don't need to have wait for a global agreement on carbon taxes because the EU is going to have one unilaterally, the US may have one unilaterally, and it is in fact perfectly possible for us to have one unilaterally. Which one could be on that? Yes, yeah, so and I think it's, well, I, I've, the, my argument in recent times has been it's inevitable. Yeah. The US will go for some of the reasons I gave down this route, I believe. The EU has said it will go down something like this route. Um, I think the idea that other countries will buy in lock, stock and barrel to the European ETS is for the birds. Um, therefore, a carbon border tax is a much more likely mechanism. And of course, I think that uh, what you need to do is to go for the, the biggest bang for your buck. So you start with the sectors on the countries um, where you'll get the biggest improvement. And, and then I think you're able to take these arguments more credibly to voters, showing that you've already made a difference. Uh, and I, th I think, therefore, sequencing them um, is, is always going to be dif difficult. Point, yes, and, and, I, and I think you, you, you'll get more acceptance of, of that sort of argument if you can show progress uh, in things like um, the, in the emissions argument, and which is why I think that... Uh, this is the time. There are times in our politics where you are faced with, uh, you either are going to move forward and make progress or you're going to be left behind. And this is one of those moments. And if we actually believe that some of these things are inevitable, then why or why are we not the ones showing the global leadership? We've got the COP, we've got the G7. This is our time. Post Brexit, with the freedoms that we have, if we want global Britain to be a reality, then let's show that it's possible to make a change in the areas that matter.
A, a, a few uh, more technical questions on the, on the proposal. Um, um, Paul Anier uh, asks, uh, to offset the impact of the carbon tax, why wouldn't governments like China simply assist exporters with additional subsidies and credits? And um, Rosalie Rivago asks, how would a carbon border tax uh, work across goods that are manufactured in several countries? Well, that, that, would, be, that be, would be more difficult and is one of the inherent uh, technical challenges and would need to be dealt with with somebody with uh, infinitely more information and knowledge than, than, than I would have at my disposal. Uh, in terms of course, China could choose to subsidise, but any subsidies would have to, again, fall within the WTO uh, permissions. Um, they would not be allowed just to apply illegal state subsidy, uh, otherwise they would fall foul of WTO and find themselves on the wrong end of penalties anyway. So uh, I think if we are confident enough to move forward, I think that the, uh, the options for them uh, remain largely limited um, and push them in the direction of, of greener energy production uh, and lower emissions, which of course is the very point. And there are those who say, let's not talk about this right now. Let's not talk about in the run up to the COP26 in case it upsets people. Well, what do you think that they haven't thought that we're thinking about it? Do you think that they don't know that the Americans and the EU are already thinking about it? This is uh, an argument that is out there to pretend that if we don't talk about it ahead of Glasgow, um, uh, it won't come as a nasty surprise uh, to some if we introduce it is, is, is not realistic. Uh, we need to accept that this debate is out there globally, that we are one of the countries at the forefront of it, and as I said, have the courage of our convictions to take it forward. Well, actually, it's a, a, a question has just appeared as, as you were asking that. I mean, yeah, so I'm, which I'll, I'll, from Jerome, Jerome Mayhew, which I'll, I'll adapt. Do you think that's what's stopping the government adopting, taking a leadership position on this, particularly in the G7 negotiations, that they're worried that, that, about the impact on COP? Well, you know, what, what is the point of these big international conferences? Is it that we all sign a meaningless communique at the end and pretend to be one big happy family, or that we actually produce change? I mean, I've, I've sat through as, as, as a minister a number of big international meetings and the, the latest one being uh, uh, the last round uh, where we produced an international communique in Tokyo where the basis of it was that we took out anything that anyone could possibly disagree with and we ended up with verbiage at the end. Um, and the, the, point, the point is to produce outcomes. It's not to produce further process. Uh, and I, I think that... If that is a consideration, I can't say because I'm not a member of the government and don't know what they're considering, but if in any way that is uh, putting them in a position where they want to delay the discussion of the subject, I would say uh, you're wasting your time. Um, we need to have these discussions sooner or later um, and uh, you know, let's be on the side of the angels. Um, two final questions. Um, one uh, from an, one of our YouTube viewers asks, um, do, what do you make of Dieter Helm's argument, Professor Dieter Helm's argument, that a national carbon tax rather than emissions trading is the, is the precondition for a carbon border tax? Um, well, I th I do, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I, I fully agree with that. I do partially, but I do think that um, where you, I think where the link is, is if you have a national carbon system, you've got to have a carbon border tax as well. Otherwise, you disadvantage your own consumers and producers and you can get the perverse outcome where we are increasing and increasing our price for smaller and smaller gains in terms of emissions while those who are the biggest polluters are getting all the cost advantage uh, competitively of, of low production prices. Uh, that seems to me to make neither climate sense nor political sense nor economic sense. And uh, a final question from um, Eamon Ives, who is our um, Head of Energy and Envi Environment here at the CPS, who says, um, as well as carbon adjust border adjustment mechanisms, are there any other trade policies or reforms that you can think of uh, to adopt to ease the transition to net zero? Uh, for example, um, slashing tariffs to zero on environmental goods and services. Well, we'll not go into the woes of the WTO right now, because that would take me way too long. Um, but... In an organisation faced with the climate change emergency that cannot even agree to have an environmental goods agreement where we can take down the price of wind turbines or solar panels uh, or any of the other costs that would actually make it cheaper for many more countries in the world to adopt green technology going forward for their energy generation suggests to me that we are at a real inflection point here 
um, as, our, as, as Liz Truss was saying yesterday, you know, it's do or die for the WTO unless we can actually find global mechanisms uh, that can make it possible to reduce costs in the very areas that we want, then the WTO is a busted flush. Um, and it either reforms now or it starts to become increasingly irrelevant uh, in the years ahead. That's an enormous challenge. It's an enormous challenge, I would say, for many of the global institutions that were designed in a former era. The WTO itself um, was designed, th was, came into being just a couple of years after that Margaret Thatcher first speech. Um, and the world has changed dramatically. Unfortunately, many of the global institutions have not. And when you get uh, an organisation like the WTO, where some of the biggest economies in the world are allowed to self-define as developing, you can see the big disconnect between the process and reality. So uh, it is possible to get these things, but I would say in the global environment in which we find ourselves, if we can't get a global environmental goods agreement together, what hope is there for doing anything else? It's a pretty good question to end on because it's a good marker to watch. Well, in, indeed. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fox, on behalf of all of us here at the CPS. Uh, thank you all for watching. Um, please do follow at CPS Think Tank, sign up to our newsletter, CTC, and uh, um, please join me virtually, obviously, unfortunately, in thanking <laughs> Dr. Liam Fox. Thank you very much. Thank you.